It's my privilege on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Latino Leaders Network to welcome all of you to today's event, an event that we have put together to honor one of our own, one of our most outstanding leaders, the former mayor of this great city, the mayor from 1983 to 1991, who ran on the slogan, Imagine a Great City. And look at Denver now, the host of the Democratic National Convention for the first time in 100 years. Federico Peña, we are very proud to have you here with us, and we look forward to paying tribute to you today as we present the Nambe Eagle Leadership Award for your outstanding public service. To start our program, the Reverend Lucia Guzman who performed the wedding ceremony for Cindy and Federico recently and is the director of Denver's Agency for Human Rights and Community Relations will now deliver our invocation and bless the food. Reverend? Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we pause now during this very busy day and this wonderful time in Denver to remember the great gifts that you have given to us for the great gift of love and for sustaining hope through the hard times as well as the good. We give you thanks for the journeys we have traveled together, some which have been difficult and many fulfilling. We thank you, O oh God, for our lands, our water, our air, and our bountiful crops we remember also our ancestors who have worked this land, built their homes, and raised their children. We remember those ancestors and our people today who toil in the sun, dig in the earth, who plant the seeds, and who bend over to pull the crops from the land. We remember those of our people who have gone on before us, who are not with us in body, but who remain with us always. And now we give thanks for this day of great celebration for Federico Pena and for the women and men who have journeyed through life and have become great leaders for our people and our country. May your continued blessing embrace each one, holding our leaders near as they speak and vote for justice, equality, and peace. We ask that you bless this food and may our bodies and minds and souls be nourished. And all of these things we ask in the name of God, our creator and sustainer of us all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Mickey Ibarra, founder and chairman of the Latino Leaders Network. Four years ago, the Latino Leaders Network was launched in Boston during the Democratic National Convention. We honored then Democratic Caucus Chair, Congressman Bob Menendez of New Jersey. We are very, very happy to have so many of you here with us today. We have been joined by the current leader of the city of Denver, Mayor John Hickenlooper. We are so pleased to have him with us and have asked him to deliver some brief remarks to start our program. Mayor, please join us. And I can't tell you, I mean, the best part about having the Democratic National Convention here is to get groups like you in one place and creating the energy and the excitement that's going to change this country and is going to put a new person in the White House by the name of Barack Obama. Now I have to rec recognize we have uh, uh, several city council members, part of a mayor's job, you always recognize city council, Chris Nevitt, Doug Linkert I saw, and Paul Lopez, uh, great city council members. I had the uh, pleasure, and I don't know where he slipped off to, but the new Mexican ambassador, Arturo Saracan, who is just a remarkable man. Does he speak later? Is the ambassador going to speak? No, he'll be acknowledged. You should recognize that the world changes when you get leaders who 
understand the complexity of the situation and can communicate that clearly and articulately. And I think our New Mexican ambassador has that capacity that he is going to be able to really help bridge this, these problems that we've had around immigration and other issues between Mexico and the United States. And clearly that can't continue. And he has clearly the ability to, to change that. Uh, I think his mantra probably is, si se puede. Uh, put that in his mouth. We also, I saw, we have two great legislators here uh, from the southern part of the state, Senator Ken Salazar and his brother, Congressman John Salazar. <laughs> Remarkable leaders in any term, any world. And then I want to just take one second to let you know, because so many people have told us how much they love the city, how great the city is, all the things that you're looking at and appreciating about Denver. Denver had a history and then a turning point. And that turning point when the, the, new, the new generation of Denver began in 1983 with the election of Federico Pena. Everything that you see, all, the, the, everything you see out there, the new hotels, the sports facilities, all these things, the new airport, all the beautiful, modern, beautifully designed parts of this city that you're getting to enjoy were in some way, in some parcel, his imagination, his belief that you, if you imagined a great city, you could help create a great city. And I could not let this moment go without giving him praise. And my last little bit of praise was, you know, he had the eye for finding talented people again and again. And he was able to, one of his chiefs of staff was a woman who we, is in my administration now. She went with him to Washington. She was chief of staff when he was the secretary of uh, transportation. Uh, Catherine Archuleta has been our liaison, our CEO. Give, Catherine, stand up, please. This woman has done this convention. I owe Federico more than I could say just for giving, letting us borrow Catherine Archuleta. Have a great meal. Thank you so much. Glad to have you here with us. Thank you, Mayor Hickenlooper, and congratulations on such an outstanding achievement hosting the Democratic National Convention. The Latino Leaders Network, as I mentioned, was born in 2004. It's hard for me to imagine that we are now celebrating our fourth year with this event. Now 32 events completed with over 5,000 guests attending, we continue to work hard to accomplish our mission of bringing leaders together. Please direct your attention now to the large screens for a short overview of the Latino Leaders Network produced by Three Roads Communications. Thank you. Leadership, that indescribable but recognizable combination of vision, charisma, and courage. Now, there's a forum that honors leaders of the fastest growing segment of the American population, the Latino Leaders Network. Founded by Mickey Ibarra in 2004, the Latino Leaders Network recognizes Latino achievement in the fields of public service, media and entertainment, sports, and more with three signature events, the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, the Latino Mayor's Tribute, and the Latino Issue Hour. The Latino Leaders Luncheon Series really is intended to provide a platform, a platform for our leaders to share their personal story of obstacles overcome to achieve success. As a great reminder to all of our leadership community of their responsibility to be helpful to each other so we all can succeed. But the Latino Leaders Network does more than recognize achievement. Through these regularly scheduled events, it also provides bipartisan networking opportunities for Latinos to forge new relationships, to listen to each other, and to address issues that are important to the Latino community. So that when it comes to education, to building economies, to ensuring that people have adequate housing, to delivery of health care, to our position relative to other countries around the world, to national security, uh, to the environment, we're all burdened with providing the leadership in the public conversation, in the public square, about the, the direction of the American Republic. It's very exciting. The Latino Leaders Network provides a respected forum to share ideas inspiration and solutions and Latinos on the Hill is the first ever
congressional directory highlighting Latinos serving members of Congress and the American people. As the Latino population continues to expand in the United States, the Latino Leaders Network will serve as a catalyst for leaders of the future. If there's one thing that I would like for Latino youth to take away from the Latino Leaders Network, it would be to persevere, never give up, and always keep your community first. And that's one of the things that I think it's important about the Latino Leaders Network, to show who our leaders are, so that we can in turn inspire our Latino youth and our community. Leadership, it's vitally important to keep America strong, secure, and growing. Leadership, it's recognizable when you see it. Leadership, it's alive, well, and growing with the Latino Leaders Network. But as leaders, we need to make a commitment to each other. We need to be better to each other. Others may try to tear us down. We need to build each other up. That's what the Latino Leaders Network is all about. We are pleased that the Senate President of Puerto Rico, the Honorable Kenneth McClintock, who is attending, come on Kenneth, Kenneth McClintock, the Senate President of Puerto Rico, is attending his ninth consecutive Democratic Convention. And uh, Senator McClintock has agreed to introduce the national co-chair of the Democratic Convention for welcoming remarks. Senator? Thank you, Mickey. Saludos a todos desde Puerto Rico. It's not difficult to introduce who I'm going to introduce now. When Republican senators in Texas first attempted to redistrict the state of Texas to achieve in the legislature midway through a decade that which they could not achieve at the ballot box. Leticia Van de Pute led Senate Democrats in Texas across state lines to delay that effort. That requires a lot of pantalones. <laughs> when Leticia realized that NCSL had never been led by a Latino woman and she recognized that there was at least one qualified Latino woman to lead the National Conference of State Legislatures, she stepped forward and she has led all state and territorial legislators for the past year nationwide. This week, once again, she is our co-chair of the Democratic National Convention. It is a pleasure for me today to introduce as our speaker someone who, like myself, is a state legislator, who, like myself, is Hispanic, who, like myself, in my case, I'm the son of a Tejano, and she is a very, very, very courageous Tejana herself, and who, as myself, has been a legislative leader both statewide as well as nationwide. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to introduce Senator Leticia Van de Pute, the national co-chair of the Democratic National Convention. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Y muchísimas gracias. 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 Muchísimas gracias. It is indeed an honor for me to be here and to be introduced by my dear friend de Puerto Rico, who I always tell him I have two primos there. They fell in love and they were going to come back to Texas, but that was 38 years ago. <laughs> and so we feel a great connection. I am so filled with pride at this point. You know, any of you who were there last night and watched Michelle Obama electrify the convention. And wasn't it wonderful to see so many prominent speakers who were Latinos? Wasn't it wonderful to see that and to see this room? 
filled with uh, a lot of friends. We want to welcome you. Uh, we are so thankful for the cooperation of the mayor and the governor. The people of the Mountain West have been fabulous and have thrown the doors open so that this convention is one without walls. You know, this is the first type of convention that we will have that is so inclusive. It is accessible. You know, just the move on Thursday night to Invesco Field at Mile High will allow 75,000 people to witness firsthand Barack Obama accept our nomination for the President of the United States. With half of those folks in that field on Thursday night being from Colorado and two-thirds being from the Mountain West and the Southwest, it indicates that this sort of convention is really different. But it's all about accessibility. I am very proud, for the first time in the history of any convention, gavel-to-gavel -gavel proceedings, live simulcast translations in Espanol. That means that the 25 million Spanish-speaking Americans, and of course, the 300 million worldwide, will be able to see firsthand how democracy works. You know, I'm very, very proud to have worked alongside of uh, my chair, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, Una Mujer, and my other co-chairs, uh, Kathleen Sebelius of Kansas and Mayor Shirley Franklin, uh, to put a face on this convention that's one where women uh, and their roles are put at the very front. And I see all of my, my mis comadres aquí and mis amigas and it's quite a step, particularly the Spanish language translation. And very emotional for me in that in the third grade, I was disciplined and sent home for daring to speak my own language on the playground. And now it is so inclusive in the fabric of democracy of our country. You know, we say uh, in Texas that we do a little two-step. Uh, and let's face it, I'm really proud of the work that, that Mickey has done. He's not really at Tejano, but we can claim him as one. He's the favorite Mickey. Um, and he has done with his team so much to integrate the network and the leaders. Mickey, thank you so much for everything that you do. And we wanted to give you a true, true welcome. In Texas, we do that two-step, you know, step by step. It's kind of a polquita, it's a step by step. But I gotta tell you, I'm a very, very proud Democrat and uh, you know, very, very proud to have been a Hillary supporter. But I've gotta tell you that when Hillary Clinton tells me, I need you to work for Obama like you would've worked for me, it means something. And what you're gonna see, what you're gonna see firsthand is a unified, convention. At the end of the day, we have to focus on what Latinos have always focused on, and that's the next generation. You know, what heralds us and our families is the, the hope de nuestros abuelitos that the lives of our parents were better than they had it. And that our parents' dreams for us is that we would be better educated and have a better life. And our dreams for our children are the very same. That's a very American, but a very Latino sentiment. And so although I've got to tell you that my heart breaks as I was a, such an ardent Hillary Clinton supporter, that my selfishness in not allowing any sort of grudge or resentment is going to be surpassed by the love that I have for my children and my grandson for the better tomorrow for them. We call it the Texas Two Steps, but I gotta tell you, you know, I know Mickey, you run a bipartisan organization, but let's face it, we're in a room full of Democrats. You know. We got the Texas Two Step, and we go step by step, and what we hear from our Republican counterparts isn't quite that. Because when they say they're gonna support the troops, and then they deny health care and benefits to our veterans who so enorm it. That's not a two-step, that's a two-face. 
Como dice mi abuelita, es hablando de, vos, de dos lados de la boca. And you can't have it both ways. Or when you're coddling big industry and the middle class is being squeezed. That's a two-face. And so what millions of Americans are going to see at this convention is the true opportunity for change and to change the course of our country. I want to give you such a big welcome in the tradition of the Mountain West, where it's a little bit of the you pull yourself up from your own bootstraps mentality, that love of the rugged individualism, and then, of course, you know, the hospitable part of what we have here in Florida and a lot of the southern states, particularly Los Tejanos, uh, is that southern hospitality and especially from our Latino culture of the friendship, the mi casa es su casa. You know, this is all here in Denver in 2008. So what I'd like to say is, bienvenidos, y'all. It is now time for a word from our sponsors. And first we thank Western Union, headquartered right here in Denver, Colorado, for sponsoring the pre-lunch and reception. Thank you, Fred Newhouse and Tim Daly. We'll hear from the CEO of Western Union in just a moment. But thank you to Western Union for your support. We also owe a huge thanks to Verizon Communications, Emilio Gonzalez and Peter Davidson specifically. Also, of course, to the Coca-Cola Company, Rudy Becerra and Frank Ross. Verizon and Coca-Cola are the founding sponsors of the Latino Leaders Network, and we are grateful. Rudy Becerra actually was the first person I approached. Was at that time what I thought would be is a one-time event in Boston, Massachusetts four years ago. And then on to Verizon, Magda Irizarry, Emilio, Kathy Brown, others on the Verizon team who quickly saw the vision and said, absolutely, we're going to be there with you. And they've been there with us every luncheon, every time, ever since. We will now hear from Rudy Becerra, Vice President of Latin Affairs at the Coca-Cola Company for Sponsor remarks. Rudy. Muchísimas gracias. On, on behalf of our CEO, Mutar Kent, and all our Coca Cola associates that are here. In fact, I'd like to uh, introduce a few of them that are here uh, Brian Anderson, Barkley Wrestler, Frank Ross, and Ben Schittler for being here. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here to honor Latino leaders. I would also like to thank the co-sponsors of uh, Verizon and Western Union. Thank you for hosting this great Latino luncheon series. Uh, Mickey Bada, what can we say about Mickey Bada? You know, this man has an incredible knack for bringing all of us together, and uh, he's got a wonderful staff that uh, they've outdone theirsel themselves again. This has been a phenomenal uh, day, a phenomenal week, and this is a great, great luncheon. Mickey, thank you and your staff. Our congratulations go out to each and every, of, every one of the great leaders that, that, we, that we're paying tribute here today. Uh, they have a big impact, not only in the Latino community, but in, in the nation and around the world. For over 122 years, part of the thread that makes the fabric of the Coca-Cola Company has been giving back to communities in which we serve. Contributing to the creation of sustainable communities is part of the business platform that we live by from being significant employers and communities around the world to being responsible stewards of envi environmental resources through our aggressive water conservation initiatives. Where we are diligently working, we really are diligent wor dil diligently working towards one day returning 100% of the water used to make our beverages and production back to nature, including our commitment to sustainable packaging and recycling. Thank you. Our goal is to one day recycle more plastic than we consume with our new and, and recently built 
largest bottle-to-bottle -bottle plastic recycling plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which will produce approximately 100 million pounds of food-grade recycled plastic for reuse each year. And this is what really makes me feel proud. As the official recycling provider for the 2008 Democrat National Convention, the Coca-Cola Company is proud to make a positive environmental difference by providing products to the convention that are 100% recyclable. These products are being delivered in Coca-Cola hybrid electric trucks that are part of Coca-Cola Enterprise's largest heavy-duty hybrid delivery fleet. Additionally, Coca-Cola will provide bins and the infrastructure to recover and locally recycle 100% of the materials at the different venues here this week. Again, thank you for joining us and honoring uh, the Honorable Federico Peña and to all the Latino leaders that we're showcasing today. Muchísimas gracias and enjoy your luncheon. Thank you. And now please welcome Kathy Brown, Senior Vice President for Public Affairs Policy and Communications at Verizon. Please welcome Kathy Brown. Thank you. Thank you. So Mickey, we started out four years ago in a very little room in Boston. Look at what you've done. This is marvelous and we're so happy to be here um, to honor Mr. Secretary which is how I knew Federico Pina when we proudly served in the Clinton administration together. We're very happy to be here. My colleagues from Verizon are here from across the country uh, to let you know that we are uh, incredibly involved with the Latino community here and around the United States. My friend uh, Howard Woolley, my friend uh, David Valdez, uh, my friend Andreas Elando, all of us here from Verizon to enjoy this beautiful day. You'll find on your seats our little brochure, we, you know we can't help ourselves, <laughs> to show you the kinds of things that Verizon is doing in the community. And we hope that if you see something there that you're interested in, you'll, you'll, um, you'll call us, you'll let us know, you'll, you'll participate with us. We too congratulate this wonderful city uh, on this beautiful um, hospitality that we have had and uh, to the Democratic Party for a marvelously open convention. We're proud, by the way, to sponsor the website that all of you are using here uh, at the convention uh, in an open, wonderful way so that people can participate in this event. So thank you, Mickey. We're happy to be here. Have a wonderful lunch. Thank you, Verizon and Coca-Cola. And now for our reception sponsor, again, we're so delighted with the support of Western Union, Christina Gold, President and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you very much, Mickey, and it's truly an honor for Western Union to be involved this, in this prestigious event at this miraculous time in the history of our country. I think um, I cannot say enough about how proud we are in Denver to have such honorable guests in our city and at our luncheon, so we welcome you all. But we also really want to say to Federico Pena, your vision, your imagination, and your drive has made a huge difference in our city. We really talk about making Denver a global city, and it is. You dreamed about connecting us to the world, but also the world is now connected to Denver. Western Union, this is our home territory. We operate in 200 countries with 355,000 locations around the world. We connect people who want, help, who want to help each other change their lives. We believe in that. We know that that's what you believe in as well. And not only have we connected Denver to the world, but the world now is connected to Denver. This is our home base. You have made a difference and we're honored to be here to honor you today, a very, very special citizen of Denver. Thank you very much and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you, West Virginia. Very nice Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina Gold. Now, I know you all came here for lunch, and we are going to get you out of here on time. But remember, the mission of the Latino Leaders Network is to bring leaders together. And while we will not, we will not take the time to 
acknowledge all of our national leadership in the room today. There are several groups of leaders that we must recognize and acknowledge, all of us, together as we bring our leadership together. First, a very special group to the Latino Leaders Network. I mentioned that we have completed now 30, this is actually our 32nd event. 14 of those events have been the signature event of the Latino Leaders Network, the, the uh, Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, a quarterly event normally held in Washington, D.C. This year we decided to take two shows on the road. Right here in Denver, and yes, one week from today, in Minneapolis as well. Now, pretty weak. <laughs> but with the, with the venue of the Democratic National Convention within eyesight of here, understandable. A group of leaders that we have recognized with the Nambe Eagle Leadership Award given to outstanding leaders for their service to our community and to leaders that understand their special obligation to help bring us together. I would like to recognize those that are with us, and I'll see how well I can do here, but we've seen uh, Congressman John Salas out of Colorado. Mayor Antonio Villarigosa of Los Angeles. <laughs> Mayor Marty Chavez of Albuquerque. Mayor. <laughs> Texas State Senator Leticia Van de Pute of San Antonio. Also, Supervisor Gloria Molina of Los Angeles County. Gloria. <laughs> Superintendent Susan Castillo of the State of Oregon. Susan. Also, Mayor Manny Diaz, the City of Miami, and also now the new President of the United States Conference of Mayors, Mayor Manny Diaz. and a very special recipient. At least you think all we recognize are elected officials. That wouldn't be true. And our next recipient that we want to acknowledge once again, who flew all the way from Hollywood to be with us in Washington, D.C., to receive her award and delivered such a wonderful speech, again, about her personal story, Obstacles Overcome, to achieve success, Eva Longoria Parker. Eva? Mm -hmm. Thank you to all of our Nambe Eagle Leadership Award recipients. There are a number of members of Congress to help us out. Members, I hope you will understand our need to, to move our program, but all of our members of Congress you know, we are so blessed with leadership from Joe Baca, the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and all of the members of Congress here. Would you please stand and be acknowledged? Javier Becerra, Joe Baca, Silvestre Reyes, Grace Napolitano, Ruben Hinojosa, I see Charlie Gonzalez, Ed Pastor, I saw Loretta Sanchez, Nidia Velasquez said, please, Mickey, please let everybody know I was here. <laughs> but I have to go back to the hall to reverse, uh, rehearse rather, my speech today, and so please extend my apologies on behalf of uh, the chairwoman of the Small Business Committee of the House of Representatives now, Nidia Velasquez. <laughs> also, just a couple of... Uh, State leaders, some of you may recall that I had the privilege of serving as the assistant to the president and director of intergovernmental affairs at the White House. So I have a special fondness and affection for our state and local leaders, and we have so many of them here today. But I also wanted to recognize specifically Arizona Attorney General Terry Goddard. Terry? 
we also have former uh, New Mexico Attorney General Patricia Madrid here with us. Patricia. Now, I've seen Hector Barreto. Frankly, I haven't seen Aida Alvarez. Aida was, oh, here she is. Thank you, Aida. But this is really unique. We have the two most recent administrators of the Small Business Administration, both during the Clinton years and the Bush years here with us, Hector Barreto and Aida Alvarez. Would you please stand? <laughs> And also from the Diplomatic Corps, His Excellency, Ambassador Arturo Sarucan of Mexico. Ambassador, are you here with us? Thank you. And Her Excellency, Ambassador Carolina Barco of Colombia. Ambassador? Former U.S. Former US Ambassador to Spain, Ed Romero. Ambassador, are you here with us? And indeed, a very special guest, the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Jose Miguel Insulza. Would you please stand? Well, this is a nonpartisan event, as Leticia so well reminded me. This is a room full of Democrats. There are two acknowledgments that I also want to, to make. We have Rick Noriega, former state representative from Houston, veteran of the Iraq War, and candidate for the United States Senate from Texas with us today, Rick Noriega. <laughs> also, Ben Ray Lujan, Democratic nominee for the United States Congress from northern New Mexico, Ben Ray will surely add a member, a new member, to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus in January. Ben Ray, are you here with us? Uh, you had to leave? Okay. We'll know that we're thinking of you. We also, I'm told, that we have the Ambassador of Spain, His Excellency Jorge Escalán. Would you please stand? Ambassador, thank you for being with us. Finally, in terms of our acknowledgments, a special thank you to our local leaders here. When we decided Federico was the honoree, and he was so willing and able to be of assistance to us, but, but also we realized that we had to have a group of local officials, local leaders. And as all you know in this room, it's the local leaders that really get the job done. And so we asked Ramona Martinez, former member of the city council, chair of the Democratic National Committee Hispanic Caucus to meet with us and together the most important Latino leaders in Denver and the surrounding area to assist us with this event. And I would like to thank Ramona Martinez who, Ramona, are you, uh, would you please stand Ramona? I know it's hard for you to stand. <laughs> yeah. And again, just a, a thank you. If they're in the room, please stand. Uh, council members Paul Lopez, Judy Montero, Rick Garcia. Uh, Tim Sandos with the uh, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. We also have Rosemary Rodriguez, the chair of the U.S. Election Assistant Commission, who has been helpful to us. And finally, Polly Baca, the La Raza president. Polly, there we go. Next Gen Web is making today's event available everywhere that broadband is available by live streaming at nextgenweb.org. This is a first for the Latino Leaders Network. We are now literally live all, all around the world because of broadband, and we thank Next Gen Web for this service. I also want to thank Southwest Airlines, the official airline of the Latino Leaders Network. Lydia Martinez and uh, Laura Nieto, thank you so much for your help. Okay, now for our, our first tribute. 
Janet Murguia, former Deputy Assistant to the President for Legislative Affairs during the Clinton administration, Deputy Campaign Manager for Al Gore, and now a key leader in the Latino community as President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Council of La Raza, will deliver the first tribute to our honoree. Janet? Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Isn't this a great event? Mickey, thanks again for all your work. This is really wonderful. So many wonderful leaders and such a celebratory effort here. I'm so pleased to be sitting next to my good friend and a real champion for our Latino community, Eva Longoria. She does great work. And in fact, she just helped us co-executive produce and host the Alma Awards, which will be airing on September 12th on ABC. I hope you'll support Eva, the NCLR, and our Latino artists and, and talent. So let's watch the Alma Awards on September 12th. Eva, thanks for all your work in making that happen. This is such a wonderful occasion. I do recall being involved early on in the political scene, and as Mickey mentioned, uh, being deputy campaign manager for Al Gore and, and working in the White House. But I have to tell you, I've never been at a convention where I've seen this much representation from our Latino community. And you know what? It's time. It's time for us to be seen and to be heard. And I commend all of you for being here. And I certainly want to commend and honor our honored guests today. You know, most people know Federico Pena as a cabinet secretary overseeing the transportation and energy departments in the Clinton administration. Others may remember him as a former mayor of a city who championed the state-of-the-art airport facility that many of us have flown into. But long before he became into prominence as a political figure, uh, Federico Pena was a lawyer and an activist working to improve opportunities for his community. Many might not know this, but he served as a staff attorney at Maldef in the early 1970s. John Trezvina is here. He probably appreciates that early work. He also, Federico uh, Pena, served in the mid-1970s. He promoted increased educational opportunities as legal advisor to the Chicano Education Project. In coalition with other organizations, including several NCLR affiliates, the project helped establish a groundbreaking consent decree requiring equal educational opportunities for English language learners in Denver, which became a model for many others throughout the country. After serving two terms in the state legislature in 1978, he won an upset victory to become, of course, Denver's first Latino mayor in 1983, galvanizing a multiracial, progressive coalition in the process. But he could show he was one of those early leaders who said, we can do this together and brought communities across other communities together. He was quite visionary even then. And he was reelected to a second term in 1987. During this period, Federico emerged as a national spokesperson on Latino issues, playing key roles in policy debates on education and immigration reform, affirmative action, and other issues. He also strengthened ties with national Hispanic organizations and worked hard to use his influence to support their efforts. We all benefited from his leadership. And after deciding not to run for a third term, Federico entered the private sector, forming Pena Investment Advisors. And some of you may not know this, I don't know how many of you know this, he's been quite successful. Many would think that he could have gone on and just done that, but not this leader. He was very committed to public service, so when asked to support a, a top-notch Latino legal talent working to promote a Hispanic perspective on diverse issues, including transportation and telecommunications, he was called upon uh, for his service uh, to serve as the Secretary of Transportation in the Clinton administration and he has used his influence to continue to support Latino causes. Among other things, he has continued to play an important role in preventing anti-immigrant ballot initiatives from being considered in Colorado and for helping to mitigate the adverse impact of state legislation. He's continued in his leadership in his effort to preserve affirmative action in the state. And we all know now that he is a very wonderful and close advisor to Senator Barack Obama as his chief advisor on Latino affairs. This is someone who we've known to respect his intellect and his commitment to our community, and we appreciate that leadership that he's given. But what we really love about 
Federico Peña, is this is a man who's never forgotten his roots, who's never forgotten where he's come from, and down in the deep south of Texas, someone who has always carried his community in his heart and in his values, and we are so proud to honor him today, a great successful business leader, a great political leader, but more than anything else, someone who is a great leader for our community and who will never forget where he's come from. We're honored to pay tribute to you today, Federico Peña. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Janet Murguillo. Our next tribute will be delivered by Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, the 41st mayor of the second largest city in America, Los Angeles, California. But Mayor Villaraigosa is a national leader as well. Recently elected to the Board of Trustees of the United States Conference of mayors. He is a tireless champion for the less fortunate among us, a visionary capable of bringing leaders together, and a leader who never stops dreaming big. Please welcome Mayor Antonio Villarigosa. Gave Mickey a kiss and I said, I love you, baby. And I do. And let me, before I say something about uh, Frederico Peña, let me just say something about Mickey and the Latino Leaders Network. For those of you who were there uh, at the first event that they put on, uh, that he put on, if there was one person in this community uh, that could bring all of us together uh, from every part of the country, Democrat and Republican, uh, it was Mickey Ibarra. Mickey has been a promoter of the common good, a promoter of our community, uh, like few people anywhere in the country. And I can tell you, he deserves an incredible applause today for this wonderful outpouring of support for Latino leadership. Let me say that uh, when I walked in the room and saw the number of people who were here today, uh, my heart was lifted. As I saw some of my colleagues who, uh, who I've served with in the California legislature, or now in the Congress, seeing the Congress members who are here from uh, the various states, uh, hugged and shook hands with a man who we're so proud of, the governor of New Mexico, uh, Bill Richardson. <laughs> Looked at my mentor, La mujer que siempre me jala de las orejas, Gloria Molina over there. Saw all of the people here uh, who have been on the front lines and in the trenches. And every one of us know, every one of us, if you're Bill Richardson or Ken Salazar, if you're Antonio Villarragosa or Gloria Molina, you know that we all got here uh, on the shoulders of others. Every one of us know that we got here because we have a community that has come together, a community that has stood up uh, for the idea that we have every right to be represented, that we've created uh, wealth in this country, that we've contributed mightily to the nation, and that we uh, have a right to be heard. And to see uh, the leaders who are here, uh, knowing that every time we open up the door uh, for one of us, we open up the door for all of us, for everyone uh, in our community for those who are legal and those who are not, for those who can read and those who can't, for those who come from rural areas or urban areas. And so I'm very, very proud to be here with so many of you, uh, proud of the tremendous advances that we've made. And yet, as much as we've gained, we still got a long road to go and a great and bright future. Because every one of us know uh, that the work out there uh, is tough. Uh, we've got to convince the nation uh, that we're here to stay. Uh, que no nos vamos. Que aquí estamos y no nos vamos. Que vamos a votar, no nomás marchar.
que estamos aquí y vamos a defender los inmigrantes, aunque muchos de nosotros ni pueden hablar español, pero sabemos que tenemos una responsabilidad a ellos que nos han dado todo. And in that regard, I wanted to be here when uh, Mickey asked me to say a few words about Frederico. I wanted to be here because his election uh, was one uh, that touched me in many ways. I was uh, the president of the American Federation of Government Employees at the time. I represented uh, equal uh, employees at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They had five offices, one of them uh, in addition to Los Angeles, was in Denver. I remember watching him uh, as he campaigned. I remember uh, when he got elected. I remember the pride that I felt uh, that this man, who represented a city that had maybe 20% Latinos, 8% Latino voters, who built a coalition, who stretched out across every community in Denver and said, imagine a great city. I said, imagine what we could do when we all come together. I remember being so inspired uh, by that vision, so inspired by this man who was willing uh, to go against the odds, who didn't take no for an answer, who didn't believe that because we weren't a majority of the electorate that it wasn't possible for him to become mayor of a great city. And while I never ever thought about running for office uh, before then, uh, I was inspired uh, mightily by that. And I remember in my own uh, case when I first started running for mayor and people said, well, Latinos aren't, you know, 25% of the electorate. There's no way that a Latino could get elected till 2013. I remember thinking about Frederico Peña, a man who was unwilling to accept uh, the proposition that we can't uh, cross over, that we can't reach out. Uh, that we can't get elected by a broader community. Uh, and so uh, I come today on the shoulders uh, of Frederico Peña. I, as I understand, am the first mayor, first Latino mayor of a city uh, this size, four million people. But I recognize that I didn't get here alone. I got here because there was a civil rights movement. I got here because it was a voting rights act. I got here because there was a Bill Richardson, a Gloria Morina, a Frederico Peña, a Richard Alatorre, the many Art Torres, the many people that opened the door for me. So I wanted to come uh, to acknowledge my friend, my leader, a man who has done much in public life as mayor, as secretary of transportation, secretary of energy, and now as Barack Obama's chief advisor. I can tell you that I look forward to going on the campaign trail with you. Uh, to sharing with America a vision of hope and change that embraces every community. Uh, you are, without question, my hero. Mucho gusto. Y God bless you all. Well, that Antonio, he does make us proud, doesn't he? <laughs> The governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson, will deliver our final tribute. He made us all so very proud as a candidate for President of the United States. The former United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Secretary of Energy, a leader who served along with Federico Peña in the cabinet of President Clinton. I am honored and proud to present the Honorable Bill Richardson for a tribute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, please sit down. No, no, keep standing. <laughs> you know, uh, gracias, thank you so much. You know, I was in Israel, in Tel Aviv, about six weeks ago, and I just finished a meeting with 
the Prime Minister of Israel. And as I'm leaving, this motorcade comes in, 20, 30 cars. I said, it must be Secretary of State Rice or the Prime Minister of Syria. It was the mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villarregosa. <laughs> que fregón, Antonio. I said, my God. <laughs> you know, uh, and I, I tell you that story, which by the way is true, <laughs> because it gave me a lot of pride. And in honoring Federico, I think Mickey, uh, one of the things about Mickey Barra that he's always done, siempre lo ha hecho, he always brings us all together. I don't know about this bipartisan stuff he talked about, but <laughs> he brings all of us Democrats, he's got to do that because he's a high powered, you know what. <laughs> But I want to, you know, before talking about Federico, and I'm, I'm only going to be brief. Primero, thank you to all here that helped me in my race for president. Thank you so much. As you know, as you know, I encountered in that race two problems, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but apart from that, apart from that, I want to just, I know there are a lot of, very deserving individuals here. You know what gives me the most pride? Not just seeing Antonio and, 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 and people like Noriega that he's gonna be a senator. You better be nice to this guy. <laughs> Go write him a check. Is seeing and having young men and women come up to me and say, uh, my name is so-and-so, I'm a city councilwoman from Ohio or Wisconsin or Kansas. It's not just the Southwest. It's not just New Mexico and California. It's national. And our community has become national. And it's a very diverse community within a community. Now, in honoring Federico, I want to just mention three people that are here. Because I remember attending Democratic conventions. And there weren't too many of us Latinos there. I mean, they barely would give us a room when we wanted to meet. <laughs> and look at today. Look at the Latino vote. Look at all the press. It's so strong. And look at all the distinguished ambassadors that are here. The Secretary General of the OAS. You think he would have showed up 25 years ago? This guy is here. And the ambassadors from all around Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much for being here. But the three people that I will mention, and because my story about Federico, I'm going to tell two stories. The tributes, you know, I don't want to get him, I don't want his head to be too big. <laughs> but the three that I'm going to mention attended those events with me long ago. We had them on little boats, you know, the Latino caucus. One was a woman that, she was very young, she was probably our first, maybe with Esteban Torres, our first top Latina in the White House. And now she's made history in California. That's Gloria Molina. And I thank her. The other, actually, I'm, I'm not going to go to four. The other is who else? Dolores Huerta. She's here. The third is sitting right next to her. And this guy was head of all the Latino organizations, mad, had, sad, bad. <laughs> Our own ambassador from New Mexico, ambassador to Spain, Eddie Romero. <laughs> and Mickey, you brought us all together, and I appreciate it. The other one is an extension of a man who I remember, along with Ed Royball, and I remember with Bobby Garcia, used to get up in the floor of the house and talk about our people and our struggles. He used to talk about injustice. He used to talk about the poor and housing. His son is here. He's now a member of Congress. But let us not forget the great pioneers like Henry B. Gonzalez and Charlie Gonzalez, his son, who is here, Congressman Charlie Gonzalez. Now, we're entering into another campaign. And you know how we all Latinos, we all are thinking, do we have access? Are they paying attention to us? Who are the top Latinos? Well, 
You know, I'm very confident that this team is a good one with Federico, Temo Figueroa, I know him. I don't know if he's here, but he's good. Frank Sanchez, the financing. Really, Frank? You know, I think what is important and, and, and so critical is that our voices be heard. And sometimes I have always seen every campaign needs to do better. And I hope that our community, through these individuals, continues to have that access that we deserve. Because you know what? This nation is going to go the way Florida, New Mexico, Nevada, and Colorado go. And that's a Latino vote. Now, Federico Peña, Mickey said eight minutes. That's impossible for a man of my verbosity. <laughs> but let me just say something about Federico Peña. You know, the thing about Federico is he always is ahead of his time. He was mayor of this great city. Today, one of the big issues is our transportation needs, the need for open spaces and light rail, the need for not just having highways, but having mass transit, of having accessible airports. Federico Peña was a visionary long before this became a main issue. And as mayor of this city, he built a great airport. He built a great city with light rail. He was ahead of his time. And this is the main reason why I think, as Antonio mentioned, this guy is going to be our voice in the Obama administration. Federico, congratulations. Now, I'm going to conclude. Voy a acabar this Joe Baca. You know, all these Hispanic congressmen. Will the members of the Hispanic caucus please stand? Please stand. God bless you guys. Look at. You know, look at Silvestre Reyes, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, of all the Intelligence Committee. I mean, the CIA, he controls everybody. I mean, that's what gives me pride, all the chairmen we have from the Congress that are here. Federico Peña was Secretary of Transportation. Did a great job. But I think, as Janet Murguia mentioned, he wanted to come home. He wanted to come home to Denver. He'd had enough of the cabinet. And then Bill Clinton had persuasive powers that are non pareil And Federico wanted to come home. But somehow, Bill Clinton always insisted that he needed to have at least two or three Hispanics in the cabinet. Well, there was a slight problem. I was UN ambassador, so it was two, and that was quasi-cabinet. So he needed a cabinet member to stay. And Federico wouldn't stay. So he left town. He left Washington, D.C. And I remember getting a call from President Clinton, and getting a call from Al Gore. Where's Peña? Can you find him? I said, what am I, the CIA? I don't know where he is. Well, we need him to be Secretary of Energy. And Bill, you know the energy issues. You've got Los Alamos, Sandia. I hung up. Federico Peña called me and he said, Bill, is this true, this rumor that uh, President Clinton wants to be Secretary of Energy? You know that department. It's a cesspool. I don't want anything to do with it, do I? I said, no, you don't want anything to do with it, but you got to do it because the President wants you. And I said, well, where are you, Federico? He says, well, I'm at Dallas Airport. I'm in the bathroom. I'm hiding. <laughs> anyway, President Clinton did get him to be a great Secretary of Energy. Federico Peña then went on to have two distinguished cabinet positions. He always saw future leaders like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And it's a great honor for me to stand here to just say that this is a man who I think is going to go into, at the very least, his third and fourth cabinet position. <laughs> but maybe he doesn't want that. He's shaking his head. I think he's going to kill me as I leave. But I thank you all. Muchísimas gracias. God bless you all. Let's have a good convention. Let's win this election. Are we going to win?
Latinos for Obama. We got to get that vote out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Governor Richardson. Senator Ken Salazar of Colorado will now introduce our keynote speaker. Senator Salazar also made us very proud when he ended our absence over three decades long from the United States Senate in 2004 with his election here in Colorado. He is an advocate for all of us, an advocate for all of us every day in our nation's capital, and we are grateful for his leadership. Please welcome the Honorable Ken Salazar. Thank you very much, Mickey Ibarra, and uh, welcome all of you here to the west, uh, to the grandeur of the Rocky Mountains and to a place where we are at ground zero and Colorado's nine electoral votes are going to put Barack Obama over the top. <laughs> yeah, we have come a long ways as a nation and uh, as a community. And certainly when we think about Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, Willie Velasquez, Hector Gutierrez, uh, many people who have gone before us, uh, as speakers have said before me, we all stand on the shoulders of giants to have this kind of an opportunity today. You know, I look around this uh, wonderful room and I see great members of the United States House of Representatives, including the Chairman of the Hispanic Caucus, Joe Baca, and so many of the rest of you. And it is absolutely an honor and privilege to serve with all of you. It's always important for us to remember that it wasn't so long ago when we weren't there. It wasn't so long ago that we didn't, that we didn't have anybody in the United States House of Representatives. It was 30 years that we went without having a member of the Latino community in the United States Senate. And it was, it has never been until 2004 that we ever had anybody in the United States Senate elected outside of the state of New Mexico. So we have made some progress in the political front and in the business community. When we look at a person who was involved in putting together the efforts here in Denver, Colorado to host this great national convention, we have a businesswoman and a businessman, Linda Alvarado and Robert Alvarado, who have led the way, and so many other people who have uh, done so much. I look at Ambassador uh, Romero, and long ago I remember visiting him in Washington and him inspiring me and inspiring me in my race for the U.S. Senate as well. So all of us are the products of a lot of people. And I want to say this about uh, my good friend uh, Federico Pena. You know, for me, I remember in uh, 1983, I was a young man here in Colorado starting out my legal career with one of the largest uh, corporate firms here in Denver. And there was this man who decided that he was going to run for the mayor of the city and county of Denver. And I still remember him hearing from a lot of people just what you have heard around this room. I know many of you in your own careers that it couldn't be done, that he couldn't win, that there was no way that a Latino who had been a fighter for civil rights and justice and equal opportunity that this city was not able, would not elect somebody like him to become the mayor of the city. And I remember as we campaigned around this city, the slogan of imagine a great city. I remember the t-shirts that we wore. I remember that the day before, or the week before the election on that Saturday, that we went out when they said it was going to be a very close election. And on one day alone, we registered 4,000 voters in the city and county of Denver in one day alone. <laughs> Federico, Peña, Federico Peña did not know who I was. I knew who he was. He was an inspiration to me. He did not know then what effect he was having on me as a young lawyer in this town. But he inspired me. He inspired me to move forward and to reach the highest stars of the heavens historic American dream that we get to live. And as he inspired me along the way and he got to know me, not only did he provi provide the tutorial for me in terms of what became a milestone here in our great state of Colorado, 
And that was in 1998 when I was elected to be the Attorney General for the state of Colorado. There are many people who said again that a Latino could not win a statewide office in Colorado because only 8% of the voters were Latino. And Federico Peña said, that's not true, you can win. And in 1998, I was the only Democrat to win a statewide office in the state of Colorado. And it was because of his inspiration. And he didn't stop there. In 2004, when lots of people said there's a man by the name of Pete Coors that's out there who has all the money in the world and every place in the state of Colorado is named after his family and nobody, nobody can take him down. He's too tall of a man and too good looking of a guy. And Federico Peña was there with uh, Catherine and with Linda and with Saul and so many of you who are in this room. And you were telling me, si se puede, si lo vamos a hacer. So here's how I want to uh, just conclude. Imagine a great city. Imagine a great city. Today, the eyes of not only the nation, but the eyes of the entire world are upon the state of Colorado and the city of Denver. Those eyes are on this city because someone a long time ago imagined that the city and county of Denver could be a great city. But it's not just that there are 18,000 journalists in town important uh, reporting on the wonders of this city and the beauty of our mountains. It is the people who live here in this state. It's the people who are in this room. It's the people who model themselves after someone like Federico Peña. Someone who has lived the American dream, but someone who has never forgotten that for every American dream that we achieve among the Latino community, there are 45 million other people out there who ought to have the same opportunity to achieve that dream. And Federico Peña, Federico Peña, in one word, is simply a dream maker for all of America, including the Latino community. I love you, Federico. It is my honor to introduce you. It's, uh, it's wonderful to refer to you as Senator, Ken. Congratulations <clears throat> for all that you have uh, accomplished and all the great pride that you have brought, not only all of us in this state, but people throughout the country. Because as you know, uh, Latinos uh, from everywhere look up to you and call you in your office every day because they think you're their Senator. So congratulations, Ken, and thank you for those very... Very, very warm and gracious remarks. I, uh, I want to thank everyone who spoke. Uh, the mayor, Antonio Villaragosa, who some time ago as he was contemplating whether he was going to run a second time, he and I had a conversation in Los Angeles where it was a very complicated conversation, as we, we will say, but he has gone on and done what he's done, and we are so proud of him. So congratulations to you, Antonio. <laughs> remarkable, remarkable accomplishment. And Governor Richardson had to leave, but he does embellish the story a little bit. <laughs> For the reporters in the back of the room, <laughs> please don't quote him too literally. <laughs> but I want to thank the governor for his very kind and warm and generous remarks. Uh, Janet, what can I say? Uh, you started uh, this, and I'm glad it wasn't a roast, uh, this uh, session with your wonderful summary of my life, but more than that, your very personal comments about me. So I thank you very much, and congratulations to you for what you do for La Raza, and for all of us. Be before I introduce my family, I, I want you to know something. You might expect that given my background, which you've heard about, <clears throat> that I have received a few awards here and there. 
but I want you to know that as I sat here listening to all of you who gave me tribute, I was very, very moved. And I must say that of all the events that I've been to where someone has recognized me, this one is the best. It really is. And uh, I'm going to get back to that story in a second, but it has to do with my roots. And for those of you who are from South Texas, El Valle de Rio Grande, where we drank the water. <laughs> you know, when we were raised in a very small town in South Texas, and where you looked at the rest of the country as almost a foreign land, very far away, and then for so many of us who have left those very small communities and have done what we have done, and then to be here with such an extraordinary group of elected officials and leaders, community activists, and people from all over the country, you must understand how much that moves me. And, and that's why I say this award is, is the best. I want to introduce my wife, Cindy, who is here with me at the front table, who, um, I'm going to be careful, Mickey, who was a strong supporter of Barack Obama long before I was, and who persuaded me to get on board. I'll explain that comment in a second. And I want to introduce uh, a couple of family members. Uh, a brother who's come all the way from Texas, uh, Oscar Pena, who was from Dallas, and his wife, Rochelle, who were here. And uh, my brother, Alfredo Pena, who was a lawyer here in town, and his wife, Dolores. And I, there are a lot of friends here. I, if I introduced all of them, it would be here uh, too long. Let me explain why it is that I said, Mickey, I'll be careful. Early this morning, I was, after getting four hours of sleep, finalizing my remarks about why I was going to persuade you to support Barack Obama as our next president. <laughs> but then I got a funny phone call about 10.30 from Mickey. And Mickey says, now, Federico, remember, uh, you're not supposed to make a partisan speech. You're supposed to talk about your life story. And the theme of this leadership series is to encourage Latino leaders to come and talk about the obstacles that we face in our lives and how we overcame them and how we were able to accomplish whatever we've been able to accomplish. So I had to get that speech, Mickey, and throw it in the trash can <laughs> and quickly scribble a few notes about my life. So I have to be very careful, according to the dictates of the chief here, my good friend Mickey Ibarra, not to be too partisan and not to say too much about the gentleman whose button is on my lapel. How'd I do, Mickey? Am I doing all right? <laughs> all of you know, because everyone else has acknowledged it, that I'm a national co-chair of the Barack Obama campaign. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I'm going to be brief because uh, we have lots of things to do. Ken, thank you for being here. Let's give him a round of applause, please. He's a great man. You know, I think my story is very similar to the story of everybody else in this room. We, in our own ways, have faced obstacles from wherever we have come from and whatever we have done. And in some way, we have persevered and we have overcome those obstacles, and sometimes we've been knocked down, but we've always picked ourselves up, and that's why so many of you are here today. And there are millions of Latinos and Latinas all across our country who have done what you have done and what I have done in the sense that they have gone way beyond what their parents had done and what they ever thought was achievable. And because of that, our nation is great. Our nation will be greater in the future because as we know, this nation has always been a nation of 
immigrants. And with the new wave of immigrants whose sons and daughters are winning gold medals at the Olympics, whose sons and daughters are the valedictorians of their high school classes, and whose families are then threatened with deportation. We are one America. We are America. And Thursday, I will once again be with the immigrants who are going to be marching in the north side of this city, as I did three years ago when 80,000 came here to Denver and marched at the state capitol. Some of you know, gracias. Gracias. Si se puede. Gracias. I was, uh, I was born in South Texas, as you know. My mother and father had six children. What you probably do not know is that after I was born, I was the third oldest in the family. My brother Oscar was two years older than I was, and then his older brother, Gustavo, was two years older than he was. My mother had triplets in 1948. And as the story goes, nobody had a clue, particularly the doctor. Era de Brownsville. Please, don't quote me. I'm going to get letters from the doctors in Brownsville. I know I am. And as the story goes, my dad is in the waiting room, and the doctor comes out and says, Mr. Peña, congratulations. And he came back five minutes later and said, Mr. Peña, congratulations again. And you know the last line, right? Mr. Peña, congratulations again. So my mother and father had six children in the course of seven years. And the point that I want to make is, like so many mothers and fathers, so many Latinos and Latinas across this country, their main commitment was to us, their children. They sacrificed everything for us. From day one, it was always understood and expected that we were going to excel in school and that we were all going to go to college, which we have done. Unfortunately, three of us became lawyers. But it was because of our parents who understood their roots, which went back over 240 years in Laredo, where the founder of Laredo, Texas, El Coronel Tomás Sánchez, is my great, 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 great grandfather. And he had ancestors who fought on my mother's lineage during the Civil War, one of whom, Santos Benavides, used to ride his horse from Laredo to Austin, Texas, as a member of the first territorial legislature. But because he could only speak Spanish, he needed a translator. And people were offended in the legislature back then that he needed to use a translator. In some ways, some things have not changed. But that's how I was raised. And I was raised with the understanding that I should always be proud of my heritage, my family, my roots. And whatever I have been able to accomplish in my life, it has come from that self-centeredness, that confidence, that feeling that you're standing on a rock because you've been here for a long, long time. And many of you have been here for a long, long time, particularly those of you from New Mexico, that has helped guide me in my life. So when I moved to Austin, Texas, which I thought was a foreign country, 300 miles from Brownsville, Texas, and I entered the University of Texas that had 35,000 students, which, by the way, had a student population larger than my hometown of Brownsville, Texas. And when I set foot on that campus and realized that less than 1% of the entire student body was minority, including African Americans and Latinos, and Native Americans, and Asian Americans. Less than 1% of the campus was minority. I can recall walking through the campus from one end to the other and not being able to say hello to one person because I didn't know anybody. But I was there for four years, and somehow I persevered. And then when I applied to the University of 
Texas School of Law, I took the law school standard admissions test. For those of you who are lawyers, you take the LSAT. I am a terrible test taker, and I did poorly, very poorly. I won't tell you how poorly. I don't want to discourage any of the young people here. But I wanted to go to the University of Texas School of Law, so I applied. And I remember the assistant dean, God bless his heart, he's no longer with us, said, Federico, you can't be admitted. Your scores are too low. And based on statistical analysis, we predict that not only can you not succeed in the University of Texas School of Law, if for some good fortune, some luck you're able to graduate, you won't pass the bar exam. And so you're taking a seat in the school that ought to go to somebody else whom we know, best, based on their test scores, will absolutely succeed and go on to become a great, brilliant lawyer. And so I didn't accept no. <laughs> it wasn't the first time that I have not accepted no. And I kept bothering him. Every two or three weeks, I go back and say, come on, Dean, you've got to let me in. There has never been a family, in, a, a lawyer in my entire extended family, and I want to be the first. And he said, no, your scores are too low. <laughs> So I went back week after week, and finally, two weeks before school starts, when they have, I think, five slots left for other people, I guess, he said, well, you've been so persistent, and you apparently, apparently really want to be a lawyer, we'll finally let you into the law school. Well, fast forward, and irony of ironies, years later, I was invited back to give the commencement address <laughs> at the University of Texas School of Law. I was made an honorary member of the COIF. And now I am a distinguished alumni of the entire University of Texas school system. I have a feeling a lot of you in this room can relate to that story. I moved to Denver after I graduated from law school, and I did pass the bar exam in Texas. My brother Alfredo was here. I, I don't think I knew anybody else. Alfredo was going to law school here. I was intending to continue my civil rights work to go work with California Rural Legal Aid in California. It would have been interesting had that happened, but I stayed in Denver and I went to work for Maldiff. And so, uh, as a civil rights lawyer, and I made the decision not to become a corporate lawyer, but to become a civil rights lawyer because I believe that was the right thing to do. That was in my heart. I was involved in the first tri-ethnic desegregation lawsuit in the United States, Keys versus the Denver Public School System. And that case went all the way to the Supreme Court and back and back up again and back. And my responsibility was to represent the Latino students, and the Latino teachers who were not represented in that case. And we were able to do that. And after I did that, and it was a, an interesting time because that's when somebody named Corky Gonzalez was in this city and he was marching everywhere. <laughs> and he created a lot of excitement in this city and a lot of challenges. And so when you're a civil rights lawyer doing the kind of work that I was doing back then in that tumultuous time, and by the way, my hair was a little longer back then. <laughs> it was a challenge, but somehow we persevered, and we thank Corky for his contributions. <laughs> when I decided to run for the state legislature, uh, someone said, you can't do that because you're not from Denver. I moved into my district. There was a gentleman there who had been a, a community activist for 25 years. I was the outside shot. I walked for five and a half months door to door. I was elected my first term. And my second year in the legislature, I was elected the minority leader, which is very unusual for a 32-year-old uh, freshman legislator. And it was so tumultuous that the person that I beat for that position, who was a great Democrat for, for many years, left the party and became a Republican. <laughs> but we did what we could in the state legislature of the minority party. I left the legislature and someone came to me and says, why don't you run for mayor of Denver? And Antonio, I said, why should I do that? There's an incumbent who's been here for 14 years. He's got a million dollars in his war chest. He has 99% name recognition. I have 1% name recognition. My first name is Federico. My last name is Peña. Why wouldn't? And I, people encouraged me to run and so I ran. And as been said earlier, there were so many naysayers. People would say, Denver's not ready, ready for a Hispanic mayor. You're from Texas. You're too short. <laughs> You're not very well known. 
and you don't have any money. But I sensed in this city, what I feel in this country today, this undercurrent of discontent, this sense of thousands of people in the city who wanted to contribute, who wanted to participate, and felt they weren't being given an opportunity. And I was one of them. And I said, we are going to bring this coalition together of African Americans and Latinos and Asians and environmentalists and labor and, neighbor and neighborhood people and gays who had never participated in a mayoral election in this city. And we brought everybody together. And the night before the primary election, I got a call from a reporter whom I will not mention and not identify. And he said, I'm required to call you because I'm calling all the candidates running for mayor. How do you think you're going to do tomorrow morning in the primary? There were seven people running for mayor. And I said, you know, I have this strange feeling. I think we're going to come in first. <laughs> and there wasn't laughter, but there was a silence on the phone <laughs> for about 10 seconds. And he said, well, we have you coming in fifth. So the next day, it snowed in the middle of May <laughs> in Denver. And we had a record voter turnout in the history of Denver in a mayor's race. And I came in first. And the next day, after the election, that reporter came back into my campaign office and he took his little note card. For those of you who are reporters, you know those little pads you have. And he closed it up and he put it in the back of his pants and he folded his arms and he said, OK, tell me what's happened to my city. So I had to explain to him what had happened to our city. And so as they say, the, the rest is sort of history. We went through a tough time uh, in rebuilding the city. We hope you enjoy it. But most of all, I want to echo the comments that others have said. When I decided to finally run for mayor of Denver, I also looked to somebody else. And he was here earlier today, and his name is Henry Cisneros who was the mayor of San Antonio before I was mayor of Denver. And he came here one day to speak to a crowd, and of course, Henry's an extraordinary and gifted orator. And I listened to him, I heard him, and I said, maybe there's some way I can possibly run. So all of us in our own way have been inspired by others. When I went to Washington, there were some people who said that people with a last name like Benya are not appointed to the Department of Transportation. That's sort of a different kind of non-traditional appointment or whatever people refer to it as. But we were very proud of the work that we did there. I won't correct Bill's story, story about how I became Secretary of Energy. I did not use that adjective that he used. <laughs> but I was very proud to serve in those two, in those two departments and came back home and started a business and I'm a businessman now. But I'm not going to tell you the rest of my story. It's very common to what all of you have experienced. I simply want to say two or three things when I think about what I really want to say to all of you today. And that is very simple. When I talk to young kids and they ask me, what should I think about? I want to become an astronaut. I want to become a doctor. But I'm not sure I can do it. I say three things. Number one, Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. What's in your heart? If you truly believe you can become an astronaut, and if you want it badly enough, go do it. I don't say it's too hard, you're too short, you're from another planet. Go do it. And the second thing I say to them is believe in where you have come from. You have a proud history, a proud tradition. It is deep. It is rich. It will give you strength. Remember it and stick by it. And the third thing that I say to people, don't forget to seek some guidance from the one above. Because there will be, in your journey, in your journey, there will be some ups and there will be some downs. There will be some highs and there will be some lows. And you always need to have that guiding force in you to keep you focused straight ahead. So my closing remarks to all of you, 
is that we have come a long, long way. Each of you in your own way have gone through your struggles and accomplished much to be here today. We're all thankful for the guidance we got from our families or relatives or someone who inspired us, who encouraged us, and who had confidence in us. And our responsibility with the extraordinary political power that we now have in this country, and people like Antonio and others fully realize this when they live in a city like Los Angeles, is our political power, friends, is just starting. Is just starting. And we already know that the census has advanced the time before 2050 when our country is half minority and we will be almost 35% of the United States population. But with that potential, with that opportunity comes responsibility. All of us have the responsibility to make sure that as our communities grow, as we contribute to our country, that we find a way to do what we can to eliminate this extraordinary dropout rate in our school systems. We cannot advance with 50% of our children dropping out of school. It will make no difference if we are the largest population if we are dropping out of school. It will make no difference if we are the largest population if our kids are still in our jails. It will do no difference if our kids don't have good jobs. We are America. Our responsibility, our obligation, is not simply to celebrate what we do in this city this week, is not simply to recognize the great achievements that so many people have done for many, many decades in our country so that we could be here today. Our responsibility is to look to the future and to say we have to do whatever we need to do now to make sure that all these young kids do better than we have done, move this country forward, become the next presidents, become the next CEOs, become the next chairman of boards, become the next astronauts and scientists and Nobel Prize winners, so that in the year 2050, all of us can say, if we're still around, that we were proud of what we did in the year 2008, because we made sure our community continued to be great in this country. That is our responsibility. That is our obligation. And it is with that spirit I very humbly accept this reward on behalf of the thousands and thousands of great Latino leaders in our country who couldn't be here today. Gracias, que Dios les bendiga. Gracias. The Nambe Eagle Leadership Award. Federico, on behalf of the Latino Leaders Network, we are so proud to give you this award in recognition and as a thank you for your outstanding contribution to our community and to our nation. Federico Peña.